All right. Um, while uh, while we go over the uh, the uh, uh, announcements and whatnot, I do have a homework to get back to you. So homework one has been uh, has been graded. So let me sort of work on passing that out. So let's see. So Mr. Adkins is not here. All right. There you go. Mr. Kirk Shanks. Ms. Davis. Mr. Dowdy. Mr. Fadiga. Mr. Foreman. I'm just going to set this over here. Mr. Giles. Mr. Lewis. I'm just going to set it over here. Mr. Lybrand. Mr. Mason. Mr. Mays. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. McCracken. Ms. McGeehan. You are the man, thank you. Mr. Mitchell, uh, yeah, there you are. I know you're in here. Mr. Morris. Mr. O'Neill. Uh, I'm just going to set it over here. Well, here no, okay, all right. You're the man, thank you. Mr. Potter. Mr. Scarberry. Mr. Schaffer. Is that everything? Yep. Mr. Tharp. Mr. Watson. Where? Oh, there you are. Mr. Weekly. Uh, I'm missing two. Uh, I'm worried about him later. Mr. Adkins. Okay. All right. Uh, quick announcement. So I've got homework one turned back to you. I'm going to go through this solution real quick. So. Um, so here's the solution, and um, I think all in all the calcs are pretty straightforward. So you know, it, the big thing is just making sure that you know you're using your right beam length, tributary width, and uh, live load element factor. <coughs> Once you've got that, I think it's pretty straightforward. You know, calculate your tributary area, live load reduction, load factoring, uh, and go on down the line. Ultimately, for problem one, you should have got a bending moment of about 341 foot kips and a, a column load of about 86.4 kips or 86,400 pounds. Um, let's see, for problem two, uh, it's really just about making sure you use your appropriate width, um, uh, especially, I think, with your, your girders because framing into those girders, you only have one reaction on each end, not two. Now for that column, I really think the easiest way of going about the column is to use the tributary area. You can hip bone connect to the leg bone and do the, uh, the reactions framing into it. I just think the bookkeeping is a little harder. It will work, but um, I think it's easier just to uh, distribute your area. As for the snow load, I just reported the ATC report right here. And um, ground snow load should have been about 80 PSF for the University of Maine. So that's that. Uh, I am passing those out. Actually, let me get those passed out. Well, yeah, but but that's Maine, so. No, that, that was, I wanted a, a, like an appreciable value, so. Um, let me get these passed out. I think that's enough. Yeah, I think. Might be one extra. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm starting to feel more and more guilty about that trip to Orlando that I made. There's that. There we go. All right. So you all have uh, solutions to the homework, and you have um, uh, your homework turned back to you. Uh, let's see what else. You also have a homework due on Wednesday. So do you all have any questions?
about the homework due on Wednesday. Hope you've started it. Was there an extra over here? There is it. Uh, can you pass? Can you pass that back to a row? Does anybody got any questions about the homework? All right, hold on, sh hold on, hold on. Yes, sir. On the last problem, though, the three bars, like, they get separated, like, by, a, like, a large gap. It's, like, two and two that do the edge of the thing. Does that do anything different? No, just make sure that your D distance is at the center. Right. So the question was, if you have your rebar, like, separated or if it's in two layers, does that affect anything? No, just make sure D is to the center of the pattern of rebar. And yeah, and then all in all, it should be the same. Any other questions? All right, it's due on Wednesday, so I hope everybody's got that. Um, two other points. So um, the uh, uh, for SAME members in the room, there's a uh, Michael Fitzwater Engineering Scholarship that's offered uh, if you're a member of SAME, and the application is due on the first as well. So um, I've instructed the officers in SAME ASC to get that out to the members as soon as they can. If you are interested, uh, you can email me and I'll forward the application on to you, but it's due on Wednesday. So if you're interested, you probably want to jump on that as soon as you can. Everybody good? All right. One final note. I mentioned this in steel design, but I'll mention it in here as well. So I'm, I mentioned at the beginning of the semester that I was going to start to have classroom visitors coming uh, in the not too distant future. We've got one in steel coming on Wednesday. Um, the concrete visitors, I don't think, are for another couple visits. But the only thing I ask is just try and be on time, which really isn't a big deal in here because there's a lot of folks in here that are in steel as well. So if you're in steel, just like you know, by osmosis, you're going to be here on time. So, but that's all I got there. All right. You, you like that? You like that? <laughs> all right. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more about those ACI requirements and ultimately get into uh, maybe some procedures for design, and then we can start uh, cranking out some design examples today. So we'll be sizing you know, the beam, how wide does it need to be, how deep does it need to be, be placing the rebar in the beam, you know, um, how many uh, bars or the, how many number sevens or how many number six and, and all that. So we'll be doing that uh, very, very soon. So it's some pretty, pretty cool stuff coming up. Okay. Um, let me see. get that and then I want to start by looking at this because um, I think this is pretty important so this is by and large where we left off last time Look, and basically what we were trying to do was utilize the uh, ACI Whitney stress block approach to uh, determine maximum capacity of reinforced concrete beams and this is a very important principle that I want to make sure everybody is, is comfortable with. So, um, for instance, concrete, we have a nonlinear region of, of behavior that we'd like to simplify. So we simplify that through the use of a, a, a rectangular stress block that you see there on the right. So the depth of that stress block is always 0.85 FC prime. Uh, and the, the depth going down is, is A, which is related to the, the neutral axis depth C, that beta 1C, and we're going to talk about that uh, today. So that's how we assume um, concrete behaves uh, in compression. We assume a uniform stress of 0.85 FC prime acting over a depth A. Okay? So um, that's the, uh, the elements in compression. For tension, for the steel in tension, we always assume that the steel yields in tension. In other words, that it reaches its stress of Fy. And we're actually going to talk about that assumption today and see how we can validate uh, that assumption. Um, <coughs> in order to determine bending capacity, it's little more than just finding out how uh, deep or what this value of A needs to be such that C equals T, and then just some moments. You know, your force times your moment arm. And that's it. Okay. By and large, that is how you determine the um, maximum moment capacity of a reinforced concrete beam. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? All right. So let's, let's talk about some specifics as it relates to the spec. 
Okay. So let me go back to right here. Okay. So I want to talk about the ACI requirements for the beam, uh, for, for a given beam, what are strain limits, what are limits on reinforcement, uh, what's going on with the resistance factor. You know, in steel design, there really isn't much talk of the derivation of a resistance factor because they're just there. You know, for yielding, it's 0.9, for fracture, it's 0.75, and then that's it. For concrete, the resistance factor is a little more involved. You actually have to kind of compute it depending upon uh, what's going on. Okay. So let's start off with strains, and let's see what we can go on, go on with here. You know, you all uh, obviously, or at least hopefully, understand the relationship between stress and strain, you know, between what you do in deformable and what you do in civil engineering materials. But, um, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time earlier talking about stresses because that's how we um, derive our maximum moment capacity. But in order to assess whether or not the, beaming, the beam is behaving the way that we want it to, we're going to look at its strains, okay? So um, one of the first assumptions that we're going to make is that the strain profile is linear. So, you know, at the neutral axis, and you all have, have seen this before, you know, if you've got a beam and bending, the top's in compression, the bottom's in tension, and right along the, uh, the neutral axis, you have no strain at all, right? And you all should be fairly familiar with this by now. <laughs> we're going to assume that that strain is always linear, okay, always linear, okay, so that, that's point one. Point two is in order to define that strain profile, we're going to need to know one of the values. We're either going to need to know what is the strain at the top where the concrete is in compression, or we're going to need to know the strain at the bottom in the tensile region. In order to define that strain profile, we're going to assume that the strain at the top is always 0 .003. And that's a pretty reasonable uh, value if you start looking at different uh, 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 mixes of concrete, you know, 4 KSI concrete, 5 KSI, 6 KSI. By, by and large, 0 .003 is a pretty reasonable value um, for an upper bound uh, estimate of the uh, the strain in concrete. So the maximum usable strain in concrete, the, the epsilon sub Cu, that's uh, 0 0.003. And that's a constant we'll use throughout the semester. Everybody good? Okay. Well, if you've got that, then a couple things will help you determine what's going on down here. Okay. So if we look at our beam and we look at our stress profile and our strain profile. So the stress profile, I think you're fairly, fairly familiar with at this point. Uh, it's a uniform stress of 0.85 FC prime. A is the depth and that's related to C and this constant beta 1, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. The big thing though I want to uh, emphasize is that A and C are not the same thing. C is where the neutral axis is. That's where there is zero strain. Okay, A is how deep that block is. Okay, so there's a difference between A and C. All right, everybody okay with that? And the difference is this term, beta sub 1. So far, so good. Okay, now beta sub 1, that's pretty easy. It's just a look. Okay, so beta sub 1 is a quantity that will tell you how deep your stress block is, and it's a function of the uh, type of concrete you're dealing with. In other words, if you've got 4 KSI concrete, your beta sub 1 is 0.85. If you've got something like 8 KSI concrete or 10 KSI concrete or something like that, it's 0.65. And anywhere in between, it's a linear fit. And if you want to know, if, you're, if you want to uh, understand a little more about it, you know, why does beta sub 1 go down um, as uh, FC prime goes up? The idea is this. The stronger and stronger concrete gets, the less ductile it gets. In other words, if you start looking at these stress strain curves, notice how as the capacity gets higher and higher and higher, the curve tends to go in a little bit. So, so what that's saying is, is as your uh, FC prime, as your compressive strength gets larger and larger and larger, really the magnitude will get larger, but this depth will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So, so this is a pretty easy lookup. The big thing, though, to keep in mind 
that 0.85 FC prime and beta 1 are two independent quantities. Let me get that here in a second. Um, beta 1 could happen to be 0.85, uh, and those values are equal, but let me be clear. This beta 1 varies, but this is always 0.85. That never changes. Yes, sir? What, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. The, the, the answer I would say is that if you can develop a concrete that has a compressive strength of like 10 or 12 KSI, but has the same ductility as like a 2 or 3 KSI concrete, call me because then we can be millionaires. Uh, <laughs> um, really, it, it, it's a trade-off, you know what I mean? Um, as strength goes up, ductility tends to go down, and it's just sort of one of those things you really can't avoid uh, in concrete. If someone were able to develop a high-strength concrete that also exhibited that level of ductility and at the right price, they'd have their own private jet in a, in a very short amount of time because that, that would be... Uh, that would mean a lot of money for them. Sound good? So get to work on it. <laughs> Call me when you're done so I can take all the credit. <laughs> all right. Sound good? Yes, sir. Oh, you are the man. Thank you. I keep forgetting. It's just, it keeps, it keeps just, get you know, get so excited about concrete design I just forget the attendance. I was getting better at it, and then, you know, Orlando. Orlando. Orlando just messed me up. My equilibrium's just thrown off. Okay. Let's go on. Let's, let's discuss some more limits. So let's get into, um, let's get into the steel. So um, by and large, this limit usually never governs the design of a simple beam, but it's still something you need to check. Regardless of what's going on uh, in terms of how much moment is on the beam. Yes, sir. This is the scale. Oh, it is? Yeah. Man, I am really messing up. Sure enough, it is. And I can't say that my coffee hasn't kicked in because I, I, I had my coffee pretty early today. This one is the right one. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. So <laughs> this limit, going back to this, this limit is not one that, um, that, that tends to govern a, a whole lot, but it's still something we need to check. Regardless of what's going on with the amount of moment on your cross-section, uh, ACI states that I, I don't care how much bending you've got in your, in your beam, you still need to provide at least some amount of reinforcement in order to ensure that you don't have... Uh, uh, premature and sudden uh, failure. So it's pretty straightforward. You calculate your minimum amount of reinforcement by taking the width times the depth over the yield stress times the maximum of these uh, two values, either 3 square root of FC prime or 200. <laughs> Remember, FC prime, plug in PSI, get out PSI. All right? Sound good? All right. Okay. Now, one of the assumptions that we made when we did that, um, that uh, 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 reinforced uh, beam analysis earlier is we assumed that the steel yielded, right? Remember, the tensile force in the steel was AS times FY. Y'all remember that? Well, in order for that to happen, the steel has to actually yield, okay? Well, the way that you verify that is you compute, well, what is the strain in that steel, and then does that strain exceed the amount of strain required for yielding? So how do you compute the strain? Well, here's your strain profile, okay? Based on that stress block, that A and beta sub 1, we can compute C. Okay, so here's C. We know the top of that is 0 .003. Well, if we know the strain at the top and we know the depth, we get that strain profile down. So all we have to do to get the strain in the steel is just use some similar triangles. We say, all right, 0 0.003 is to C, 0 0.003 is to C, as the strain down here is to this, which is D minus C. 
Make sense? Then you, then you got that, you just flip and multiply to solve for this strain. Okay? So we can compute that strain and compare it against what strain is required to cause yielding. Now how do we get that? Well, that's pretty simple. I mean, if you've got a stress strain curve that looks something like this, you know, here's your stress, here's your strain. I mean, what's the strain curve or stress strain curve look like? It sort of goes up like that, right? And it sort of does that, and then it sort of goes on something like that, right? So this, that is Fy, right? And we're trying to determine, well, what is the strain at yield, right? And if the slope of that line is E, right? So Y, or F sub Y, equals E times epsilon sub Y. Just divide, and I can solve for that, right? So for grade 60 steel, our strain in our steel better be something like 0 .002 or larger to ensure that that strain uh, reaches yielding. Sound good? And keep in mind, we want our steel to yield, all right? If we were talking about the failure mechanism of a beam, which do we want to happen first? Do we want the concrete to crush first, or do we want the steel to yield first? The answer is we want the steel to yield first, because when steel yields, it's a very gradual, drawn-out failure mechanism. It takes time. With, if the concrete were to crush first, when it crushes, it goes, okay? So in terms of designing a floor system that your grandma is going to be, you know, on 24-7, if it's going to fail, you want it to fail very gradually and very suddenly so that grandma has time to get out, you know what I mean? Make sense? You don't want the floor to go boom and then grandma has a bad day, all right? Well, that's true. All right. I, I, I don't know if Life Alert would help. If, <laughs> the bridge is falling and you can't get up. Is that what you're about to say? <laughs> I shouldn't have even brought that up. <laughs> that would be very crushing. Yeah. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's let's. Let, let's, 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 let's move on to concrete design. All right. Now, one of the limits that is required for beam elements, in other words, members that are experiencing flexure, is that whatever's going on, the strain in the steel has to be greater than .004. And this is the specification's way of stating that if you have a member that is primarily subjected to bending, your steel better yield, okay? The steel yields at what, 0 .00207 for typical grade 60 rebar? Well, the spec is saying, I don't care about that, the limit, it better be greater than 0 .004. That's the spec's way of, of ensuring that for a beam, the steel yields. In other words, it experiences tensile strains larger than that required for yielding. Now, let's be clear, this limit, wouldn't be applicable for something like a column because a column is just experiencing compression. There is no tension, right? So in, in a column scenario, we would not be able to meet this limit. But let's also be clear when we're looking at a column, our fee value gets significantly lower. For beams, we can have fee values of around 0.9, but for columns, we're going down to 0.65 because if a column fails, that's bad. So our usable capacity, we drop that down really low. We apply a really stringent factor of safety for columns. Okay? Make sense? Okay. <coughs> now, okay. The last thing I think we really need to talk about is, in fact, fee. So let, let's dig into that a little bit. So I'm going to throw out the words tension controlled and compression controlled. What I mean by tension controlled or compression controlled is I'm talking about the mode of failure. In other words, we would prefer that members are, that beams are tension controlled because we want the steel to fail first. We want the steel to yield 
before the concrete crushes. If the steel yields, again, gradual drawn out mode of failure. That is a tension controlled section. Okay? We have large deflections, we have warning of failure, we got plenty of time to get people out. Tension controlled is what we like. Compression controlled is what we don't like. That's when the concrete fails first. It is a much more sudden, dramatic uh, element of failure and there's little warning. When it goes, it goes quick. Okay? Um, so you're, when we look at our fee value in a second, I think this will make sense. Transition regions are anywhere in between, somewhere between uh, the steel yielding and the concrete crushing, whether or not it's tension controlled or compression controlled. <laughs> now, we account for this desired behavior and our factor of safety through the use of a strength reduction factor, a fee. We call those resistance factors in steel design, and we've already been using those uh, in there. So they handle uncertainties, uncertainties with the material spec, with the uh, construction, uh, the fabrication, variations in dimensions, uh, approximations in our analysis. They account for all those, uh, those uncertainties. The model that we use for fee in concrete design is as follows. So I want to take a look at this. So what we have here is a graph that's illustrating how fee changes as a function of the tensile strain in the steel. Okay? <clears throat> now I want to look over here on the way right end of the graph. Okay? Now on the way right end, we've got very, very large tensile strains in the steel. Okay? So those are elements that are tension controlled. They've experienced a lot of strain in the steel, so there's been a lot of yielding present. That's what we like. Okay? So in those regions, we use a fee value of 0.9. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, let's look on the flip side. Let's look over here on the left. What if tensile strains are very, very low? Okay? If tensile strains are very, very low, like in a column, then we're largely going to be governed by the behavior of the concrete. And when it goes, it goes quick. So we reduce our, uh, our usable strength accordingly by using a fee value of 0.65. I mean, does this make sense? The idea that based on the mode of failure, we're using different factors of safety. Sound good? If we're somewhere in between either the yielding strain or 0.005, we just calculate it. It's just linear interpolation. So here's the equation for linear interpolation between this point and this point. And the only thing we need to know is epsilon sub y, and that's that right there. All right? Sound good? So, for, for instance, if we're in steel design, I mean, the fee value for gross section yielding is what? See if you all remember. No, no, no. For, gro no, for steel design, for gross section yielding, what was the fee value? Was it? 0 0.9. 0 0.9. Okay. It was simple. It's just, hey, here it is. Now, what's the fee value for beams and reinforced concrete design? The answer is it depends. It depends on what's going on with the strain in the steel. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. <coughs> now, a little bit on, this is just a little bit on notation. Um, when I'm referring to D, D is the distance to the centroid, whereas D sub T is to that lower layer. By and large, that's really not going to matter for us because in most cases, especially in design, we're going to be designing for single layers of reinforcement. When you can get away with using a single layer of reinforcement, you're really going to want to do so because it's ultimately going to save time and money on the fabrication and, and casting side. But I'll, I'll leave you all to, uh, to, to look at those. It's just a matter of D is to the center of the reinforcement and D sub T is to the, uh, to the, the very bottom. Okay. Everybody good? All right. So what I want to do is I want to go back to the beam that we just looked at, which is that's the one we did back uh, where we calculated MN. And I want to go and, and assess the, um, the ACI requirements. Does it have enough steel? What's its fee value? What's its strain, uh, et cetera? All right. So let me go back to this. <coughs> All right. So here's the, uh, here's the example. And let me move this down. All right, here we go. 
So here's the beam that we looked at. We had four KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. We had a beam that was, how wide was it? It was, B was 10 inches and D was what? Uh, 23, okay? So we calculated A, we got A to be 4.182, and then using that, we, uh, we ultimately calculated uh, MN and got 247.8. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so let's start off by looking at our strains. So let's recall a couple things. What was A for that last example? 4.182. Okay, <clears throat> now that's A. Now let me ask you this. What is beta 1 going to be? That's going to do some, that's going to make y'all do some digging. So, what is beta 1 going to be? 0.85. And why are you saying that? Exactly right. So, 0 0.85, and you're stating that based on that. Does everybody see that? What slide are you on? Go to slide 93. I want everybody to see this. All right. Everybody see it now? Everybody okay with that? That might be one of those starred slides or definitely maybe something you put on a formula sheet for a nudge, nudge, wink, wink celebration of learning. I haven't used Celebration of Learning yet this semester, have I? Bless you. Oh, it's on the syllabus. It's not for a little while. So. Is it two weeks in here? I, I steal. In here, I, I think it's a little ways away. Am, am I right? February 22nd, so we got time. That's plenty of time. Bless you, goodness. All right. Now, Here's the reason why we need that beta sub 1. So, all right, so let's look at this. So, here's the, uh, here's the beam. We got the steel right here. Now, what was D again? 23. And what was B? All right, <clears throat> now, that is the beam. Now let's draw the strain profile. So, neutral axis goes something about like this. We're drawing the strain profile. And I propose it looks something about like this. Something about like that. All right? Now, let's see if y'all been paying attention. What is the strain at the very, very tippy, tippy top of the beam? 0, 0.003. Exactly. Now, <coughs> what we're after is this. Right now, we're after this value right here, which is the strain in the tensile region, okay? Ultimately, the strain at the steel. Now, let's also see if you've been paying attention to a couple things. So what is this depth right here called? C, there we go. So what is this dimension right here, D minus C. There we go. <coughs> Sound good? All right. 
Now, how do we count? Right, let's just look at this. What do we not know off of this cross section? Is there a dimension that we don't have right off the bat? We know what D is. What dimension do we not have? C. Now, how do we compute C? What relationship do we know about C? Say it again. Well, that that ultimately be how we compute this. But what I'm asking is, we know what A is. How do we relate A to C? There you go. Exactly. A equals beta one times C. So. If A equals beta 1 times C, then C is A over beta 1. What does that come out to be? Say it again. Second on that? All right. Okay. Now. Now that we've got C, now what do we use to get the strain? Similar triangles. There we go. Now, we'll do that by saying the following. We'll do that by saying 0.003 is to C as some strain on the bottom is to D minus C. Now, does everybody understand that? Okay. So to solve for this strain right here, I'm going to say, all right, just multiply that denominator over, right? <coughs> just take that multiply it over. So 0 0.003 times that over that. Everybody okay with that? So let's start plugging and chugging and let's see what we get. So what's D again? There we go. And what's C? 4.92. Heard Mr. Davis say that. 4.9. So what do we got? There we go. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, that value, I can make two points about that value. Okay? So I'm actually, I'm literally going to write it out. All right? Points to make. Actually, I can make three points about that, that value. Um, I tell you what, though. I tell you what, though. Um, before I do that, sorry. Let me. Before I do that, that is the strain in the steel. Okay. Now let us let's compute what strain would cause yielding. Now it's in the slide, so you can follow along. But how do we do that? How do we compute how much strain causes yielding? Well, we take the yield stress. They put it over the Young's modulus. So what is the yield stress? There we go, exactly, because that, that's the, it's grade 60 rebar. Now what's E? Remember I told you I'd burn this number into your head before you got out of here? There we go. Alright, so what do we got when we plug and chug this out? It's like 207. No, we're gonna, we'll drag it out a little bit. Okay. Now, we can make two or, or a number of points about this. I say two, but I really got three. So let's do three points. So points to make. All right. When we did our bending capacity, we assumed that the steel yielded. 
How is that a valid assumption? Look at your decimal places. It was way a, des a, way a valid assumption. This is point zero zero two. This is point zero one one. That's like five times the amount of strain required for yielding, right? Now, now I, I see what you mean, because if it was another zero, it wouldn't be valid. You're, you're exactly right, and I know how that can be a little, mess, uh, a little messy to see. So I'll say assumption that the steel yields is valid. That is very valid. Now, what does ACI state that the strain in the steel must be greater than or equal to? It's in the slides. We just talked about it. Some will make you do some digging. Say it again. No, no, no. That's for fee. That's for fee. What's the limit? Zero, zero, 004. Does everybody see that? Okay. ACI states that the strain must be at least point zero zero 004. Have we met that limit? You bet. So that's the second point I can make. So two. So we'll say ACI requirement that epsilon sub t must be greater than or equal to 0 0.004 was met. So that's an important point as well. Now, here's the third point I can make. When we compute our strength reduction factor, our fee value, we compute that based on the strain in the steel. So going off of that curve that's in the slides, what is fee going to be? Say it again. All right. We compute our strength reduction factor based on the strain in the steel, the fee value. All right. So based off this, what is fee going to be? 0.9. Okay, so what slide are you on? 101. So I'll say since epsilon sub t is greater than or equal to 0 0.005, and this is what you were mentioning earlier, because it's greater than 0 0.5, phi is 0 0.9. Does everybody else see that? So you can get a lot of good data from that strain. There's a lot of stuff you can interpret from that. So if the strain was like, let's say it was 0 .0047, well, we would meet that requirement that it's greater than or equal to 0 .004, but, that, but our fee value, we'd have to compute it. We'd have to use that linear interpolation. Does everybody see that? Everybody up? This is good stuff. Everybody good? Okay. So, a couple points to make. So, um, I'm going to go on to the next panels. Everybody got this? So, so, One thing we can compute is our uh, factored resistance or phi MN. So what was MN before? Oh, I can do better than that. That's a little sloppy. All right, so our MN is 247.8, and what's phi? 0 0.9. So what is phi MN going to be? I'm taking you 
I'll do some math. Oh no. So 223.0, do I got a second on that? All right, this is the value that you would then compare to like 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live to see whether or not uh, it's valid. So we did something very similar in steel design today where we're looking at tension members and it's kind of the same story. Okay, <coughs> so far so good? Last thing that we need to discuss is our minimum steel requirement. So before we do that, we need B sub W, which for a rectangular beam is the same as B. We need D, which was 23 inches. Now, let me, put, let me do something real quick. So let's write down the equation. So what is it? It's AS min is what? BW D over FY times the maximum of 3 square root of FC prime or 200 PSI. Is that right? You tell me. Side what? 94. 94. Does everybody else see that? Oh. What's that? <laughs> it was right. All right. So. In order to do this, right off to the side, I'm going to do 3 square root of FC prime. So tell me what to write. 3 times the square root of what? Exactly, 4,000. Put in PSI, get out PSI. So what is that? There we go, got a second. So which value do I use, that or the 200? 200, there we go. So AS minimum is, tell me what to write. So BW is 10 what? There we go. D is what? There we go. And what times the maximum, so what, what's that going to be? Well, no, I'm talking about what goes on top. 200. Now, on the bottom, who said it? What? Not 60, because think about it like this. If, it, if I put 60, what are the units? So what, what do I put in PSI? There we go. Getting all trained up on them units. So what is that? All right, do I have a second on that? Now, what? Now you're going to have to do some digging. What is the actual area of steel for this beam? 2.37, right? Because it was three number eights. Do we meet this requirement then? Yeah, there we go. All right. Hold on. That's a good question. So the question was, why are there minimum steel requirements? When you write a specification, the specification doesn't really know how much moment is on a particular beam. It's just trying to ensure that beams are designed safely and accordingly. So the spec says, well, 
I don't really know how much bending moment is going on on this beam, but regardless, there is at least a minimum amount of steel that we are going to place in the cross section to ensure that we don't get sudden failure. I mean, think about it like this. Imagine if you had a beam that had no steel in it at all. No steel in it at all, when you start placing that load, all you're governing by, or being governed by is the behavior of the concrete, and when it cracks, it's going to go. So, um, the <laughs> So the spec is trying to ensure that you at least provide some level of reinforcement. Now, let me be clear. By and large, that shouldn't govern. But we're going to use it to, um, to assess whether or not um, the designs that we generate later on make sense. Is that a fair point? Everybody else okay with this? All right. Here's what we're going to do next time. Next time, we are going to lay out the procedure that we are going to be able to use for design. So ultimately what we'll be able to do is use our reinforcement uh, 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 or strength reduction factor phi and then this new concept called a reinforcement ratio which is basically a ratio of about how much steel you have to about how much concrete you have. We'll be able to use those to ultimately derive some expressions that we can use for design, okay? So we'll take our time with it, but ultimately I think it'll be pretty good stuff. All right, sound good? All right, again, just do me a favor uh, in, the, in the coming days, just make sure you're here on time. Other than that, uh, uh, with our visitors and whatnot, other than that, uh, that's all I got for you. So I will see you all on Wednesday. Remember your homework's due then. All right, that's all I got.